Victoria got the crappy microphone in the other room. I, got, I think I got the better one. All right. Buenas noches, todos Samzo. Have a day. Um, as I was introduced, I'm Michael Luhan Bavapa. I'm the co-chair for Independent Waha. Uh, my, my, my other co-chair, Victoria Leon Guerrero, um, she's pregnant, she has kids, and, sh and she, uh, she ran home, so I will be taking her place uh, tonight. She is much better at talking and looks much better than I do and has much less hair than I do. So I apologize that you are stuck with me instead of Victoria Leon Guerrero. But I promise that I make a lot more stupid jokes in my presentations than she makes in hers. And so, I am here to talk to you today about independence as a political status option for Guam. And the group that I am a part of is Independent Guam. It is connected to the Independence for Guam Task Force, which is funded by the government of Guam through the Commission on Decolonization. So you have probably heard from other individuals, such as Free Association, Statehood, each of us each of us receives support from the Commission on Decolonization to go out into the community like this to talk to you guys. We get money to, we get some money uh, each year to create educational materials to hold events. I have stickers for you guys, but you have to earn them. You have to earn them at the end by answering questions. But they are some very nice stickers. I like the Independence logo. I don't know what the statehood logo looks like. It's probably an American flag. And that's kind of played out, but anyway. Okay, this is our mission. Empower the Chamorro people to reclaim our sovereignty as a nation, inspired by the strength of our ancestors, and with the love for future generations, we educate and unify all who call our island home to build a sustainable and prosperous independent future. So note, um, one of the issues that gets sort of brought up in this is some people refer to a decolonization vote as a Chamorro-only vote. It's not really a Chamorro-only vote. And decolonization isn't a Chamorro-only process. But note, in our mission statement, we empower the Chamorro people to reclaim their sovereignty because that's one of the issues involved in decolonization. But it is attempting to educate and unify all who call Guam home. So independence is not something which will only benefit the Chamorro. It's not something that will benefit only the hairy, Zori-wearing activists like me. It is something that will benefit everybody who loves Guam, especially looking into the future. And so, Fanatsu Hitalam. Fanatsu means stand. So you're probably with, familiar with the term Fanogi, as in Fanogi Chamor, it means to stand up. Fanatsu is more similar to stand for something or rise up. And then Hitalam means it's up to us. <laughs> okay, so, one of the big things that always comes up, and I'm sure many of you have this question, is what is the matter with what we have now? Because in many ways, Guam seems like a very comfortable place. In fact, the, the, the president of our university has referred to Guam as a comfortable colony. So we're not like the colonies of the past where there seems to be a lot of suffering and exploitation. We seem to benefit a lot from being a colony. But underneath sort of this veneer of comfort, there's some very serious problems, some very serious issues. And so a lot of them are connected to our political status. So for example, you guys all know what the US Constitution is, right? It's, it's such an awesome document, right? Right? It's up there with the Bible. It's up there with uh, what other document is really cool? Whatever chain letter my aunt keeps sending me through Facebook. It's been shared like 800 million times by every old people on the planet tells me to pray the rosary nine times or else I'm going to die. No. So, you've got all of these documents out there. You may think that the U.S. Constitution is this exciting, exceptional piece created by man about human enlightenment, evolution, and development. You may have been taught in school that this document applies to you here on Guam. This document doesn't actually apply to you on Guam. In fact, the section of the U.S. Constitution which applies to every single one of you is this one. The U.S. Congress shall have the power to dispose and make all lethal rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. Guam is not a state. 
If you live in a state, the U.S. Constitution applies to you. If you live in a territory, this is what applies to you. And the Congress can extend whatever it wants from the rest of the Constitution to you if it chooses. And you may think, well, that's the way we live on Guam is just like the way most people live in the United States. It may feel like that a lot of times. But you may not be familiar that in Illinois, just a couple weeks ago, the US government argued that in the case of the territories, they should be allowed to violate the Constitution. And the federal court agreed with them. Can anyone guess what that was about? What is one of the big issues that sort of points to the lack of, the lack of fairness in our status here on Guam. Anybody? There's this big orange dude in the White House. And guess what? Most of us here had nothing to do with whether he got to sit in that White House or not. Right? This case in the States basically was, was brought forth by a bunch of servicemen, military guys, who were stationed on Guam and in Puerto Rico and felt that just because they live on Guam, they should still be able to vote for president. Because the thing is, even if you were born and raised in Iowa, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana, are there any other ones that start with I? I think I got all of them. If you come to Guam, you enter the territory. You lose your rights, except the ones that Congress provides. So these soldiers said, we should be allowed to vote. We're serving our country. Just because we live in Guam for a time, we should be allowed to vote. The government argued, no, because once you go to a territory, the Constitution no longer applies to you. This is what applies to you. And the court said, absolutely. So in the case of territories, the Constitution is a switch. Sometimes it's on, sometimes it's off. Now, unincorporated territory, this is what we are, and this is where all of this stems from. You don't have representation in Congress. You don't get to vote in the Electoral College. You are under complete legislative authority of the U.S. Congress. This is what really should change. Guam shouldn't stay in this position. We have been in this position since 1898. And there have been some changes along the way. But if you look at how much of the rest of the world has changed their status, has become more in control of their affairs, their government, Guam is still kind of stuck in this stupid colonial place. But uh, anyways, if we have time towards the end, I'll talk more about that. So, you may not be able to read this. <clears throat> so, one of the things that's very common in colonies is this feeling that if you were to stop being a colony, everything would get worse. It's a very common feeling. People sometimes feel, Oh no, if, um, if, if the United States wasn't in control of us, then everything would get worse. We would, the government would be worse, the economy would be worse, education would be worse. And it is from this feeling that is common in a lot of colonies where you feel like everything would be chaos if the colonizer wasn't in control of your life. This is something which a, a minority of Indians articulated in India before the British left. It's what people in Hong Kong articulated before the British left. It's what some people in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, all felt that if their colonizer left, things would fall apart. Because that's part of what happens when a colonizer comes in, is they tell you, we're going to help you, we're going to clean you up, we're going to teach you how to be civilized, we're going to improve your life, and if we ever leave, you'll go back to being primitive, back to being a... And so, but... If we look at our status today, one thing to always remember throughout human history, colonies are never rich. Colonies are always poor compared to the rest of the country that owns them. So even if you feel fortunate that you are colonized, you are actually getting much less than everybody else gets. And that's true throughout all of human history. And so here in Guam, our current status today, why is it so important that we change our political status? Because our political status seeps into everything in our lives. This is the way that you can see our relationship to the United States, our dependency on the United States, affects social problems, health statistics, um, economic destitution, 
all sorts of stuff like this. And it, it affects Chamorros in particular. So Chamorros are the indigenous people of the island. They're the largest population. And in almost all of the negative health and social statistics, Chamorros are overrepresented. So for example, in the homeless count, Chamorros make up the largest percentage of homeless. Um, in terms of family violence and so on, stuff like that, Chamorros also very high percentages, and unfortunately these are common in colonial situations. So this is not something where the presence of the United States keeps those things from happening. It's actually part of that relationship. And so those things tend to change when the relationship changes. When you stop sort of being in this position where another country owns you. But anyways, we can get more into those things. I don't want to take up too much time talking about that. <coughs> so, the United Nations. A lot of this discussion comes from the United Nations. The United Nations is something which was born out of a promise for a better world. Sort of, some of the people who helped create the United Nations says, it can't take you to heaven, but it can keep the world from, take, from dragging itself to hell. The United Nations reflects the best of, the, of what the world has to offer, but it can't do everything. And so one thing that it was built on was this idea that all people have the right to self-determination. That the modern world was built on a lot of people getting screwed over. A lot of people getting pushed to the side, their land, their resources, their rights taken away from them. And that improving the world means that those people that lost their rights should undergo a process where they symbolically get some of that back. And so that is sort of this decolonization process. Now, According to the UN, there are three options that meet that definition. Independence is the one that I'm in favor of. And interestingly enough, so if we did a poll of random people here at UOG today for the three status options, which option do you think would win? Be honest, be honest. Status quo. What's that? Status quo. No, 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 if you just had the three options. If you just had the three options. State, statehood free association or independence. Which one do you think would win? Statehood. Statehood. Statehood would probably win, right? When I used to teach Guam history, I would always have that. I would always do a poll at the beginning of every semester, and every single semester, statehood won at the beginning of the semester. By the end of the semester, statehood would usually not win. Because what we find is that sort of, and it's an interesting sort of thing, since 1945, 80 different countries have become decolonized. So 80 places from all over the Pacific, from all over Africa, from all over Asia. These are places where they fought for their independence, where they negotiated with their colonizer for their independence. More than 80 places. Can you imagine that? And so almost all of them chose independence. And in fact, The Guardian did a study that in 1846, when the issue of independence came up, 88% of the times, 88% of the 50 votes, people chose independence. And these are votes for places which are just as large as Guam. So there is something usually where people feel that they should get back what was taken to them, that they should have the right to determine their destiny. Now, that is why the world today is not filled with colonies. Because most people, when faced with this question, said, you know what, we're going to make some mistakes, it's going to be a hard road, but it's better that we are in charge of where we're going instead of somebody else telling us where we should go. That's why you have almost 200 independent countries in the world today. All right, so one of the things that you oftentimes hear is that independence is isolation. That independence, oftentimes people react to independence like it's this pulling away from the world, right? Like it's, it's when I finally moved out of my grandparents' house, but I, I, but, uh, and I finally gave back the car that I was using forever, and I finally said, no, Grandma, I'm not going to take your money. No, no, I'm going to live on my own, and I'm going to pay for all my own stuff. And people think about it like that, like you no longer rely on any others. You take care of everything yourself. But that's not actually what independence is, right? Even if you live an independent life, you still rely on others for help. You still work with others. You plan things with your friends. 
you, you coordinate things with people at work, you rely on the government to help create a society in which you can prosper. It's the same thing for independence. Political independence doesn't mean that Guam floats off into the space and everything now we have to grow ourselves, everything we have to make ourselves, everything we have to do ourselves. That's ridiculous. The late Frank Luhan was a senator here. He said, people say that Guam can never be economically independent. And I say that's true, but neither can the United States and neither can any other country in the world because all countries are interdependent. So get out, get out, so take out of your mind any idea that independence is impossible because it means stepping away from the world. It's not. It means joining the world through a network of global interdependence and you join as a partner, not a possession. And I can give you lots and lots of examples of that. Oh man, I can. So, uh, this is an example from a former governor. You guys remember when Felix Camacho was governor? It wasn't that long ago. Some of you may have been in middle school or elementary school. It was oh, eight years ago. Man, 16 years of Republican, Republican governors as well. Wow. Okay, so Felix Camacho is the governor of Guam. Guam oftentimes looks down on our neighbors in Micronesia, right? Because we feel like they are poor islands. They don't have as much as we do. They don't have malls like we do. Their internet sucks. They are so backwards compared to us. And they all want to come to Guam for a better life. And so people here oftentimes look down on our fellow Micronesian Islanders. When Felix Camacho was in Washington, D.C. for a conference on coral reefs, he is the governor of Guam. The moment he went to the States, no one organizing the conference did anything to help him. He had to he was in a hotel, he had to take the subway to go to the conference, and then he had to take care of all of his own stuff. But all of the presidents of the other Micronesian islands, because they are independent countries, they all got escorts, they all got money, they all got bodyguards. And so Felix Camacho has all his bags, and he's trying to get from the subway to the, to the hotel where the conference is at, and then this Escalade rolls up, and the president from one of the other Micronesian islands says, Hey, Felix, you want to ride? And he's like, What? How did you? I mean, this is the benefit of independence. And, he, and it's like, you know, even if the United States is so big and we are so small, they have to see us as a partner. They have to treat us with a minimum amount of respect. No one, no one cared that Felix Camacho was there. He was a governor from a territory. But... The other islanders, even though they're smaller than Guam and less modern or developed than Guam, they received more respect than he did because they were independent. All right, so we talk about economic difficulties and impossibility. That's one big thing that people think about, right? Is that there's no way we could survive because we could never develop an economy if we're independent. That's not really true, actually. There's a lot of ways in which Guam receives benefits from the United States. There's a lot of ways in which Guam is restricted through its connection to the United States. And you have to look and think, do the benefits we receive constrict long-term growth or more sustainable growth? So, for example, we are restricted in terms of our relationships to other Asian countries. Can you imagine that the world is moving towards Asia in terms of its economic center? Asia is becoming far more important than it used to be, and we are right here. We are America and Asia. We are hours away from all of these capitals, from all of these booming economies. And we can't actually make any deals with any of those countries. You do realize that the president of Palau can actually make deals with all of those countries. The president of the FSM can do that. Islands smaller than us can work together and sit across from the leaders of China, of South Korea, of Japan, and talk about their mutual future. We can't do that. It is to our disadvantage. Guess who sits down on behalf of us? The U.S. State Department. Do you know who's in charge of the U.S. State Department? Well, that Trump fired the last guy, and now he's... We're waiting to see if a new guy comes in. But do you think that they even know where Guam is on a map? Probably not. Probably not. So, 
Guam would res be responsible for foreign affairs would be able to represent itself internationally. You know, there's a big, huge discussion that's global right now about climate change, about rising waters. And you know that Guam doesn't participate in any of those? But all of the other islands in Micronesia and in the Pacific go, and they represent and they give voice to the people in the Pacific, and they get cheered on by the rest of the world, whereas Guam can't participate. Boost Guam's tourist base. That is a big, a big, big thing. So who determines at present who can come in and out of Guam? Is it your cousin that works at immigration? It's not really your cousin that works at immigration who determines that, right? It is Homeland Security. It's the U.S. immigration. And you may have seen in the news recently that the governor of Guam was against the military buildup for a while. Does anyone remember why he decided to turn against the military buildup? Maybe I should check your Twitter feeds. <laughs> he did it because Guam needs foreign workers. Guam wants to bring in foreign workers from the Philippines and other countries, and under Obama and then under Trump, they almost zeroed out foreign workers and said, yeah, we know you have economic needs, but we don't want to help you. We don't want to give you any foreign workers. Because it's not Guam that gets to decide that. It's a guy, guys that are in an office on the other side of the planet who get to determine that. Do you think that's fair? Do you think that that's a good way to build economic growth? I don't think so. When I say that Guam, it could boost Guam's tourist base, I'm very serious. Government of Guam officials and uh, what's it called, and private citizens, business interests have been trying to get a Guam-only visa waiver from China for 30 years. And you know why it hasn't happened? Because the United States doesn't want Chinese people coming to Guam easily. And it, it doesn't want that for its own interests. But you could basically double, if you wanted to, Guam's tourist industry within a year or a couple years if you opened it up to Chinese, mainland Chinese tourists. So finally, the last one there is the EEZ. So most countries, you have what's called an EEZ, and you, this is your exclusive economic zone and your land and off your waters, and you get to control that. For Pacific Islanders, there's fish. Sometimes there's other uh, underwater resources. Um, Guam doesn't control that. The United States actually, the federal government gets to keep any money it makes off of people fishing in Guam's waters, or anything that is, any money that is made from that. Dr. Babakwa, just to note, 10 more minutes. Oh, okay. Man, dispenses. I talk way too much. <laughs> and I love, and I'm sorry, I love to go on tangents. So, this is one thing that all of you should, should really not like. You should be, how many of you know what the Jones Act is? Jones Act, I know it's, it's not like a hipster band or anything like that. That would be an interesting sort of choice. The Jones Act is one of the main reasons why things in Guam are expensive. It is because there are restrictions on how goods, which are just a couple of hours away, come into Guam on a ship. It's, 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 in, it's incredible. And this law was created to protect the United States and its interests, but it extends out to us. And economists estimate it could increase the prices of everything by a third to a half. So this is, this is one of the big things that we would really want to change in terms of no longer being uh, hampered by all of these artificial restrictions on our economy. And so, one of, the, one of the big things that we should really think about is, of course, how our political status and how our historical relationship with the United States has brought us to a point where Guam is an island which is almost entirely dependent on imported things. How much, so if you could guess a number, what is a number for how much food, how much of our food we import into the island? 11%? Yeah, like a percent. I'm going to go eat some imported food after this. <laughs> go eat some processed, horrible, import. I've got to get diabetes soon. It's a, it's a cultural thing by now on this island. <laughs> but yes, I've... It's estimated by the government of Guam between 90 to 95% of everything that you eat is brought into the island. 
It's esti and uh, an, uh, an academic here did a study that said if Guam's port stopped functioning, in six days the island would run out of food. Now, this is part of our condition. This is part of the history that has brought us to it. And this is why things should change. Is because we shouldn't live under that. We should start creating programs to develop local, resource, local resources, develop a greater food security. And it will improve our health, it will improve our economy. And so, you guys recognize those? They have your name on it. Those are Guam killer missiles made in China, just like most everything else on Guam, except these are, are special, made special for Guam in China. So these are missiles that China specifically named for Guam because they were designed to hit Guam. They're called Guam killers. They had a big parade in which they marched into the streets and said, look, we can, we can fuck up this little island in the Pacific. Yay! Look, look at what we can do. Isn't that, don't you feel special? Now, people worry if we were independent, people, people would take over us. We would be at risk. We would be a target. Guam already is a target. And you have to wonder, why is it that China isn't threatening any other Pacific islands? Why is it that Kim Jong-un isn't on Twitter saying, screw you, Palau. I hate you, Palau. Screw you, Samoa. Think you're bad, Samoa? I hated the new Jumanji movie. The old one's better. The rock sucks. No, it's not like that. Our, the U.S. presence here is something... The U.S. presence here is something that brings some benefits, brings some security, but also brings risks. And part of the problem is that Guam, unlike most countries in the world, isn't a partner in shouldering those risks. So, does anyone here know what a sofa is? I don't mean a couch. No, I was, I'm waiting, I'm like, I was waiting. You sit on it? <laughs> a sofa is a status of forces agreement. It is an agreement that two countries make where one country says we get to put our military here, and they say, in exchange for this, we will pay you this much. And the other country says, but you are only allowed to do this type of training, and you are only allowed to do these types of activities, and if you want to increase your presence, we have to renegotiate our deal. SOFAs are standard around the world. The US has them with Japan. They have them with South Korea. They have, them, they have a limited one with the Philippines. They have them with countries in, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, all over the place. <coughs> Guam does not have one. So the United States, one of the interesting things about our, our relationship now is that we feel that we are so lucky to have the United States in our lives. The US military feels really lucky to have Guam in its life because it gets one third of an island. And not only that, it gets one third of an island where it has more freedom to do what it wants than it does in other countries or in the United States itself. Have any of you ever heard of something called a MIT? The Marianas Island Testing and Training. The Guam is the, the center of the MIT, which is the largest training range in the world. And the United States loves it. They are blowing up bombs and running exercises around the island all year round. Do any of you guys remember when there was that weird Canadian helicopter that flew slow over two months, like last year? You know that the United States allows foreign countries to train around Guam, and they don't have to tell you. They can invite, they invite the Indian Navy to come here, they invite the Spanish Navy, the Portuguese Navy, the Australian, Singapore, they all can come here and they can all make use of our waters, and we get nothing except Every time they come, the media is like, oh, get ready, Tuma. Get those shish kebabs ready at Small Village. But there's no formal relationship. We don't benefit. One of the benefits of being independent is that you would have an agreement with the United States in which you could say, you can use this much land, we get this much money. You can only do this type of training. You can't do this type of training. And that's standard throughout the world. In terms of, and so most countries in the world do not have expensive large militaries. They are part of security agreements where they sign treaties with other countries, such as the United States, for example, in order for the United States to offer protection for them in exchange for the United States having basing rights. 
or rights of movement or rights of action. Okay, and so, as I move in towards the end, so one of the things to remember here is that independence is not sort of this rude abandonment of the island. The way that independence usually functions is if it's chosen, if it is negotiated, there is a period of transition in which the United, in which the colonizer and the colonized negotiate a, a period in which after that time then the colonizer will withdraw. And usually there is funding that is offered during that time. So this is standard. And the, uh, the, the period of time that it, that it lasts depends on the agreement. So, can anyone tell me what is the only country in the world that has ever negotiated its independence from the United States? The Philippines. Very good. The Philippines. You could say Cuba, but there's, there's certain sort of uh, technicalities there. The Philippines. And when the Philippines negotiated their independence, they negotiated a 10-year transition period in which the United States continued to give them money, and the United States sent people to help train in the military for them, and, and basically sent advisors to try to prepare them for establishing their own government. And that's actually standard. In some places, it's 20 years. In some places, it's 30 years. But that is normal for this sort of thing. So it's not like the United States it's not like sort of Donald Trump comes over and says, oh, you people in Guam, you don't like me. I'm going to take my McDonald's and I'm going to leave the island. No, it's not like that at all. It's a, it's, okay, let's see here. Okay, so I am at the end of my presentation. And so, as I said, I am part of independent Guam. And so we have, we have usually three to four events every month in which we talk about these sorts of issues. So, the last Thursday of every month, we have our general assemblies at the Chamorro Village, the main pavilion. These are some images from that, where we honor somebody in our community who has uh, their legacy in terms of getting us towards self-determination. Uh, we have an educational presentation on a certain topic. Next week is our April GA, and the topic will be on how independence can help uh, save the Chamorro language. Last uh, last two months ago, it was on how Guam could develop a bottled water industry. Because we do have another model in the Pacific for Fiji water, which is very successful. Um, and so you can always attend that. That is Thursday, the last Thursday. We also have other events, uh, teach-ins, uh, hikes. We have a hike coming up to Pocket. Oh, lots of stuff going on. That's why I'm going to go take a nap. But, um... So I want to encourage you to learn as much as you can about this. No matter what your particular option is, if, for example, if you don't like independence, if you like statehood or if you like free association, what I wish for you is that whichever option you choose, you understand it and you, you know it, and that's why you pick it. So independence is not something that you should resist because you don't know much about it. 